Welcome to the workshop recorder. My name is Scott and I'm going to do a project today uh, from start to finish. Of course it's going to take me more than one day but uh, I'm going to condense it all into this video. What we're going to do is we're going to paint a kit. I'm going to show you how, how I paint with Mr. Paint or MRP however you want to call it uh, from beginning to end. And for my subject I've got this uh, Tamiya D520, a Dewatin D520. One of my favorite aircraft, uh, beautiful aircraft I think. I've built one before, they build up really well. And uh, I've got this one ready for paint. I've been sitting on this build for a long time. Uh, it uh, virtually falls together. It's ready to go. I've done a little masking with bare metal foil on the canopy as you can see. Uh, but I'll plug that canopy and we'll be ready to start spraying some paint. So what we're going to do with this kit is I'm going to take this Mr. Paint these are the three primary colors, um, RLM 70, <coughs> 74, 75, and 76. That is a German paint scheme that was frequently used on captured aircraft. And uh, this is a captured and recaptured aircraft. This is a, uh, I'm going to be using these Berna decals for this French uh, aircraft right here, this free French aircraft. There are plenty of photos of this aircraft. Uh, but a lot of color profiles and, and interpretations of those photos don't really agree with one another. But uh, I'm going with uh, 74, 75, and 76 because that was the camouflage pattern that Germany would use when it captured a decent aircraft like this. Uh, the D520 was captured in large numbers and many of them were spray painted for German use, for homeland use for training, fighter training, advanced fighter training. And they were also issued to uh, Axis countries uh, in that camouflage scheme. You'll see uh, various aircraft. Uh, I did a, I did a um, Maureen Saulnier uh, MS-406 in a captured scheme that had been issued to Croatia. So that's the same color scheme I'm doing on this D520. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to spray this with primer. I'm going to show you how I prime, I'm going to show you how I use MRP, we're going to do a little bit of weathering, we're going to do the decals, and we're going to take it from a finished build, ready for paint, to a finished model. So uh, this will take me a while to put together, but I hope you'll stick with me and maybe together we can learn something. Alright, so what I've done here, I've masked my cockpit uh, opening with a little bit of tape, it goes around the entire inside of the cockpit. I've used uh, some uh, pinstriping tape and stuffed a little piece of cut foam in there to plug up the bulk of the hull. Uh, I'm not worried about wheel wells or anything like that just yet and we're not really worried about colors yet. What we're going to do is do priming and then we're going to put down a, a, a gray primer. I'm going to be using Mr. Surfacer uh, 1200 thinned about 50-50 maybe a little more uh, lacquer thinner than primer. What I'm aiming for is just an even coat. I want this coat to prepare the surface. I don't need anything fancy. I don't need anything super thick. I'm just going in here and spraying a coat of primer on the surface to prepare it for paint. This will help the Mr. Paint adhere. For the fuselage and wings, I'll do the small little parts now. Make sure you don't forget those. Alright, so we're primed and ready to go. Now, You'll notice a different sheen on this aircraft. Different sheen of, of primer because I laid down some of it close to the aircraft, some of it further away. And that that was further away, because it's very hot here and I'm spraying in the heat, uh, dried sooner and, it, and, and when, it, when, the, when the atomized mist dries in the air and hits your, your model, it leaves behind a fuzz or a kind of a, a graininess. Well, you can get rid of that graininess with some uh, very fine sandpaper pads if you want to. Um, it didn't do it too terribly bad on this kit and so we're going to build up enough paint on there while I'm not concerned about it. Alright, let's. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you how to do a model. M-O-T-T-L-E, not M-O-D-E-L. Model pattern. This is uh, popular with guys today. Um, what you want to do is, is give the paint some depth. Now I'm painting with, uh, back when I painted with enamels, all the weathering went on top because you lay down enamels and they're opaque, you can't see through them. But this Mr. Paint goes down in transparent coats and you build it up little by little. And, uh, and so what's on your lighter areas will be lighter, what's on your dark areas will be darker. And so it gives you that, that variance that we're looking for to give the impression of realism. 
take a look at these photos and you can see what I mean by an impression of realism. These are photos of actual paint on actual things and you can see on this blue tractor uh, up near the nose of that tractor where the paint looks nice and smooth, if you zoom in there you're gonna have you're gonna have different kinds of tones. You can, even in this grainy photo you can see some light blues and some dark blues. Uh, move that onto a hard-working aircraft like this P-40 and even with a low-resolution photo, and I'm not sure if this is colorized or not, but the, the values are there even in the black and white, you can see that it's really weather-beaten. And if I take some particularly uh, harsh filters that take what's already there in the photograph, and I enhance the photograph in, in terms of contrast, and, and I uh, do some photoshoppery with it, you can see that especially behind that eye, the, 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 what looks like modeling or marbling really comes out strong. Same thing with this Maki. Look at this uh, Maki. It's a, it's a fresher paint job, but when you apply the magic of Photoshop and uh, high contrast filters, even accounting for the graininess of the photo, you still get some of this, uh, this impression of different tonal ver variations within the paint. And so um, that, that's what we're trying to replicate with a marble coat. It's impressionism. Testing my airbrush. I've got it set on low pressure for fine work so I can get up in there and actually do some fine work. And I can lay down just some squiggly lines. I'm just not trying to get anything fancy. I don't care if I pull up a little bit here and there. And you want to vary this. When you do your marble coat, you vary it a little bit. You pull back a little, give it some broader softer areas get up close and get some tight little granular areas that's what you want to do over the whole surface of your model okay I think we're doing fine here so I'm gonna put away the uh, I'm gonna put away the mule here so that's what you do and you just do this over the entire surface of the the model. You see what I, I occasionally will follow panel lines and highlight uh, and uh, darken individual panel lines in the old pre-shading method. Do a little bit of combo of both. So now we have our marble coat down and you can see that it is grainy I've paid attention to panel lines here and there just uh, to kind of pick up some of the old pre-shading methods. I mean, th this can help you, but what you really are after is this grainy, marbly look. Because what that'll do is take advantage of the transparent paint, and when we come back in here and put paint over the top of it, the surface is uneven, it's different sheened, it's mottled, marbled, and you'll get a real granular look to your solid colors. And that's what we're after, because real paint that fades is, is not even. You want to you provide depth. You want some interest in the paint. You want some uh, different uh, tints and shades within the same color. And that, combined with the weathering we're going to put on top of it, will really help us to get a, a convincing look and an impression of uh, scale uh, weathering. All right, well, I'm going to start with RLM 76. We're going to put this on the bottom, bottom and up the sides. Shake this stuff up really, really well, this uh, Mr. Paint needs to be shaken a lot, but it doesn't need to be thinned. I'm also going to revert to my uh, my Evolution, my Harder and Steenbeck Evolution, because I'm just spraying uh, broad areas. I don't need any super fine lines, although I'm not, you know, slathering it on like a, like a house painter. I don't need to get in there and do one millimeter lines. So I'm going to use my trusty old H&S for putting on some uh, larger areas of color. So what I'll do with this coat is just kind of marble it on just like we did with the marble coat you can see how we're building it up we're not trying to get a uh, we're not trying to coat the whole thing in one pass you can see that I'm building it up slowly I'm not trying to get a, a whole the whole thing painted all at once. Back in the days of enamel, we might try to make one pass, maybe two passes, and be done. But to take advantage of this marble coat underneath, we want to lay down a thin coat. 
And then what I might suggest actually is to get up and go away and come back and look at it later because you can get carried away with this with this particular step and overdo it. And that's not what we want. We don't want to go through all that work and then bury it under paint where, where it's hardly visible. Yet we don't want to underdo it where it just looks like a spotted aircraft. And so we want to make sure that we take time, to take a break and go, go away for a while and come back and look at it and uh, with fresh eyes. the first color down now you can see that uh, we've, we've retained some of the modeling and marbling uh, that was uh, that was there in the that base coat we're gonna move on to our gray now we're gonna do the top side gray it's the other main color of the scheme and I'm gonna put that over the top according to photographs not not so much uh, according to the profiles that you find online and especially not according to the RS models profile that you see on their kit they released of this aircraft. I believe it's 172 scale but on their box art they've got the French camouflage on the wings and top surfaces and they've got the German camouflage coming up the sides and I just don't think that's the way it was. It's not convincing to me from photographs. Uh, I don't see that. So we're gonna go with, uh, go with the gut, go with research and put some RLM colors down. All right, so this aircraft has, I'm looking at photos, and the camouflage pattern, I'm dancing it around on here, because I don't want my line to be super sharp. But the camo pattern seems to begin right about where the exhaust port is. So I'm gonna start there and use that as my line. Okay, now on my reference photo, there are some uh, there are some very German-like modeling effects going up onto the rudder there, and so I've replicated that as well. And uh, you can see that we're making some progress here as we as we put some paint down on this uh, on this backside. I believe I've got it where I want it. Now I'm trying to be pretty faithful to photos. Uh, reference material is always important. As this line went back on the airframe, it did degrade a little bit into a, a model, almost as if they were running out of paint and thinning it a little bit. All right, for the wings, the, the, the camouflage pattern, let me bring up my photo again. You can see that the camouflage pattern traveled up this wing root a bit. So I'm going to follow that, that fillet. You can see how that modeling has given a texture to the surface, a visual texture. Uh, that's what we want. So next. All right, well, we have our basic colors down. As you can see from the sheen of the light, it is a semi-gloss paint and it's very model-y. That's good. That means we put it on right. We want that uh, modeled look because once we dull coat this, all the sheen will go away. And see that demarcation line that goes along the fuselage between the light and dark? That's what gives this particular aircraft kind of a sharky, kind of cool look. And the fact that the upper fuselage was gray and uh, didn't have a bunch of, of uh, well, it's kind of shark-like. I like the look of that. You'll want to true up any tape that you're using for masking straight lines by cutting a fresh straight edge because you can't really trust that your tape when you lay it out is going to be straight, especially when you're trying to take precise measurements. Now I'm using this cheesy ruler, but it gets the job done. I need a four and a half millimeter strip for my invasion stripes. So I'm using this divider as a measuring tool, and I've cut three of them here. And each one I'll go along and make sure as I cut them that they are precisely 4.5 millimeters wide. 
Now a divider like this is a handy tool for scratch building and for taking precise measurements and transferring measurements, but you always want to double check and make sure your divider points are still at the right spot. Now that should be enough strip. I've got five long strips here um, at 4.5 millimeters each. Now what I'll do is I'll check them as I, as I go to make sure they're uniform. Alright, so I've put a couple of strips of masking here. These form the outer portion of my invasion stripes. And I've made sure that I have the right width according to my measurements of 4.5 millimeter stripes. And I've used this very thin tape. There are a couple of my spacers there. And I've measured it all around to make sure that the lines are equal distances apart. And this would be a big help for me when I go and put in my uh, my uh, actual stripe mask. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spray this inside portion white and then I'll come back over it with the black stripes. We'll mask off the white. Alright, we're all masked and ready to spray our white regions for our invasion stripes. I'm going to be using Mr. Paint MRP number 4 white. Don't forget when you're masking your aircraft if you've got separate parts to mask them too. What a frustration to have to come back and redo that. Alright, we're all masked up. <clears throat> For my black. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and spray the black and get this taken care of before my low tack tape starts to peel up. All right. Well, the majority of the painting is done. I'll show you what I got in just a second here, but uh, I want to talk real quick about uh, the way I did the masking. Once again, I used a, a ruler and some dividers. And even with that, some of my lines aren't precision 4.5 millimeter widths. Some of my stripes, especially up with the uh, near the rudder with that curve are a little bit uh, wonky but you know what it's good enough for me because I'm sure in the field they didn't get out their calipers and paint those invasion stripes on with uh, precision uh, although uh, you know they masked they tried and they did have guidelines but uh, what I've got here is my black has sprayed it's uh, super gloss black again I use the same black as I did before I'm gonna flat coat the whole thing so now I can start peeling this stuff off and I have an aircraft paint scheme starting to come together. Now I did make one mistake <laughs> and I was afraid I was going to make it and I've already started to rectify it. These are the flaps and the, the um, flaps I've decided I'm going to go ahead and display in the open position and part of that is to hide some of these mistakes. The stripes go down onto the flaps and they're supposed to all line up, right? Because you know, in real life they painted these things all and was one big piece. <clears throat> so as I'm uh, carrying my stripes down onto my flaps, one of them I got the I got the opposite way and I painted a I painted it the reverse, the white where the black should be. So I've sprayed the whole thing black and I'll hit it with white again after I uh, mask that. But uh, yeah, we're ready to start peeling off some of this. What I use for masking these kinds of things is is either that um, let me grab some here. There's the Tamiya tape. Everybody knows about this stuff. I don't buy that anymore because I found this MT. Um, they used to call it kabuki tape on some of the forums, but it's kind of a paper tape. It's not truly paper, but it is, a, well, I guess it is a fibrous paper. It's got a plastic coating on the outside, very thin plastic coating. And I use this for most masking and dry fitting, but I've got this um, Auto Graphics inks tape, and this is pretty good stuff. It's low tack. And even though it's low tack, I like to tape it to the board and peel it up once or twice to make it really low tack. And this stuff is just masking tape, and it cuts well, it adheres well, and I like to use this stuff especially for masking large areas. So I took some strips of this, cut them down to 4.5 millimeters, and then uh, that's what you see on my model there. All right, well, I'm going to peel all this stuff off and we'll take a look at it. All right, well, there we go. It's super hot out here, some sweat, and I'm going to call it a day at least until the sun goes down from where it is in the sky, but there's our invasion stripes. There's some imperfections here and there where the, the tape didn't quite match up, 
but you know what overall and there's a little piece of junk in the paint overall though we're starting to look good enough for this is far better than trying to fiddle with decals especially right in here if you've got a if you have a um, a curve that invasion stripes need to go over this is the only way to go painting it now I thought it would look a little bit bad I thought the uh, stripes were a little wonky in there but because of the curve actually it doesn't quite look that bad um, that must have been just an illusion uh, when I when I measured with calipers all the or with um, dividers all the lines seem to be about the right um, width well there we go I'll let this dry oh, there's a piece piece of masking still on there I'll let this dry real good before I move on to the next step and uh, well hey we're on our way in addition to what we've already done with the marbling and uh, and the way that we painted it so I'm going to be putting my decals on so that I can weather the decals as well um, I have not used these kind of decals before they look like they're quality they look thin but um, I'm gonna try the roundels and see how they work with Solva set that's what I use to snuggle my decals down into the into the details of the kit this is probably the hottest of them all it literally uh, melts that uh, varnish that lacquer uh, base that the decals are printed on and causes them to settle down now there's some things you got to know about using this uh, I'll talk about that as I go I am christening a brand new bottle of Solva set on this model I have here some warm water I don't need to trim my decals normally you would want to trim away the the, um, the backing sheet the carrier film on these decals but these are very well printed actually they're they're very tight to the to the color so I'm not gonna worry about that so what I'm gonna do is I'll use a little bit of solve set and I'll wet down the area in which my decal is going to go some guys like to use a, a brush with some of the water in there and dilute it a little bit. I let that soak in there for a few moments. And using a, a, a soft wet brush, wow those work quick, you wait until the decal slides on the backing paper and then you bring it right in place just like that. Now you want to work quick now because the solva sets at work. You want to get it into position. I'm putting some solva set on the decal. <clears throat> now here's the deal with solva set. Don't touch that. All right. Now we have. There, it's going to wrinkle up. It's going to shrivel up. It's going to look like the decal is ruined. You'll be tempted to go in there and fix it, but don't touch it. I've got it a little far out, right up against that line. But don't touch it once it starts shrinking because it will cert most certainly ruin it. You can wick away some of the excess, some of the excess moisture to help drying. But I don't want it to dry if it's not snuggling down into the detail. I want to be able to keep hitting it with solve head if I have to. And so that's what I'll keep doing. If you, if you notice here, around the edge of the decal, there is a dark red line. Now that is because the white base, all decals are printed on a white base, otherwise they'd be transparent. The white base is not quite the same diameter as the red ink printed over it. <clears throat> Again, I'm not super concerned about that for this particular model. It'll have to do. Um, but if I was really concerned about having a perfect roundel, I would actually spray them rather than use decals. And this is a good a good example of why. If you spray your decals, you're not going to get that you're not going to get that ring around there. And you're going to have perfect register as well. These these are really well printed in terms of registration and colors. It's just that that base coat is not quite the same size as the roundel. That's really hard to do by the way in printing. Uh, all right, well, there we go. Let's see how these decals perform. Here's another decal that I would almost never use. In fact, I would never use this on, on uh, 
on a regular model that I'm working on unless uh, there was a compelling reason to do so. But for the sake of demonstration, since I'm uh, actually demonstrating um, you know, all these techniques, I'm going to go ahead and use this. This is uh, going to go on the rudder. These rudder decals are notorious for not fitting well. And then um, if we have any problems with the edges along the trailing edge, I'll show you how to deal with those uh, by touching up and sanding. So we're going to go ahead and see if this fits. I'm going to I'm going to size it up here and make sure that it looks like it's going to fit. Fortunately, there's only one critical. No, that's not going to fit very well. Doesn't look like it's going to fit very well at all. All right, so I had an epiphany. I thought, you know what? The kit decals ought to fit well, and the blue on the kit decals is close enough to the blue on the roundels and the Berna set that I went ahead and cut out the decal and put it on there. Now you put it on the, the regular way. Now what you want though is you want this decal to conform around the edge. And so what I've done on this back side is I've taken solva set. Well I put solva set on the whole on the whole decal on the whole rudder, put the decal on, and put solva set along that back side and it causes the decal to kind of to curl around. And that's what we want. Right here there is a trim tab actuator underneath that decal. This solver set will make that decal conform and uh, we won't have any trouble there. If we do I'll show you how to deal with it. But um, yeah they, these are Tamiya decals. Tamiya decals are notoriously thick but for a case like this where uh, you really don't want to mess with masking and these are actually surprisingly thin decals um, and they're conforming quite well already. I have used the Tamiya decal um, on a D520 before and it uh, worked out quite well but uh, again I would normally mask such a thing but hey this is a demo and it's 8 p.m. in my workshop and it's still 90 degrees out here so these decals ought to be drying pretty good you can see they're snuggling down into the detail of the kit pretty nicely let's check on this uh, yeah, there we go. Now you can see everything's going to be fine on here, but I specifically came back to work on this little rudder. You see the wrinkles down at the bottom as that decal tries to work its way around that trim tab actuator. I'm going to go in with my knife and cut that open, and I'm going to cut those wrinkles down below at the bottom portion near the hinge, and I'm going to apply some more solva set. Otherwise, it's doing what we want. Alright, when putting your decals on with Solva Set, especially these uh, tricolors on the, or tail flashes, the Tamiya decal snuggles down really well, but you can see around that uh, trim tab actuator and just below it, there's some wrinkling. Um, you're going to get that with this kind of decal. You, you really, it's hard to avoid. And along the trailing edge, you can see the decal on the other side is, is uh, is beginning to curl now it's beginning to curl over and that's what we want we want it to curl over and as it settles in I, I just put that one on it's fresh as it settles in those edges are going to snuggle up if there's anything left over once it's good and dry we'll hit it with sandpaper sand it off and we'll go back and touch up those colors with the brush I'll show you this with the light set so the camera's a little wobbly if you're having trouble getting those decals to settle down see those decals aren't quite dry but they're not settling down the way I'd like them to into those panel lines. I've taken a, a cotton swab, a q-tip, and I've cut it at an angle. You want something sharp to get in there but not so sharp you're going to tear up your decals. And then you just want to go very lightly across that those panel lines and see if you can't work them down in there very very lightly. See that one went down in there a little better. That'll help it out a little bit and um, help you get a little better painted on look. You can see the difference between a painted marking. Well, that is just so much better than that. You can see the decal film edge and that causes trouble because it changes the specularity. The, the, it actually has an optical effect on the paint. There's not much of it here, it's minimal, but um, 
you know, if we're doing a 132nd scale aircraft or if we're doing an aircraft that really we want to be a showstopper, then we want to paint these decals on. We want to paint these markings on. The wheel wells on some of these are uh, left in the undersurface color. But a lot of times on these French aircraft, the wheel wells come from the factory with a, a khaki color on the interior. Now, they don't make a French interior wheel well interior flap khaki color that I'm aware of at least. And so that's why I think it's handy to have around um, some color strips, some uh, color chips of your paints that you have. So whenever you get a new bottle of paint, you mask off a section of your color strip and spray some paint on there and then make sure you label it. So I found looking at photographs and um, approximating using uh, dead reckoning that PC-10 will be, not PC-10, clear doped linen too will be a, a good enough match for me. It's a nice khaki color. It's got enough yellow in there to have some uh, anti-corrosion properties you know that's that's the the whole point of these these protective paints a lot of this painting that we do is basically just suggestion and you don't have to slather it on there if you can just get the color down even if it's got faded edges that's not a big deal now if you got down in there if you could get down in there with a some sort of tiny little scope or get, get your, your optivizer out and inspect the edges, you would find that the paint coverage is not very thick around these edges up here where the mask was. And that's okay. Because the eye compensates. So what we're left with is a nicely tightly masked uh, wheel well there. All right, one of the things I've done here is I misted my aircraft with water. I sprinkled salt over it and let it dry. Then I went over it with a very fine mist of a very diluted light gray. I'm gonna brush the salt off and we're gonna see the effect we get. I won't need, a, I won't need more power for brushing this off. You can see you get this speckling. Now that's a little intense. I'm probably gonna have to go back over with some uh, a little bit of darker colors as well. But you see, the intent is to give a speckle there to the finish. So I'll work on this and get this salt off. I might need the assistance of some water. But what it does is it gives a nice chipped, worn finish to the paint that I think looks very good. I have all the speckling and salt chipping done that I'm going to do. I've done it a little bit heavier than uh, I would have liked, mainly because um, I, I didn't quite dilute my, my lighter color as much as I'd wanted to. I went back over it also with a darker color, and now we've got this chippy, speckly look. Maybe a little too much, but we'll see. I think that the, the future weathering that I'm going to put on here will, will draw that back a bit and uh, it'll be all right. All right, one of the more, uh, one of the more basic steps of scale modeling um, that you will employ as you move from basic beginners to maybe intermediate stage, um, something that a lot of modelers take for granted is the, the panel line wash. Now they sell all kinds of products that you can do panel line washes with. You know, some of them are very good now, some of them are, are no better than what we're about to talk about here. Uh, this is an oil paint panel line wash. This is a real simple way to put some darkening agents within the panel lines of your model kit to highlight them. Now, clearly this is impression. You're giving the impression of reality because you don't walk up to a real aircraft and find uh, a dark line on, the, on it or a groove that's filled with paint. Uh, we're, we're replicating the meeting point of two panels, and if this was in scale, you wouldn't really see much of it uh, in a lot of instances. So we're, we're giving an impression here. But um, the way I like to do that is with oil paint. Now, my idea on oil paints is that I, I tend not to use black, and that comes, I think, as a holdover from my training uh, in the creative uh, world. I was, uh, I've been uh, 
trained in the arts and aesthetics. I've studied the philosophy of art and studied color and all that, color theory. And I've made my fair share number of incessant color wheels and tint and, and hues and chromas and all, all that stuff. So, um, I tried to use an ultramarine blue or some kind of a deep, powerful, cool blue. I tried to use a warm, dark color like this uh, burnt sienna. And so I've got a cool and a warm. If I combine them, I come toward neutral. Uh, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna, when you combine them, you get a real nice gray. And you can shift that gray toward cool by putting more blue in it. You can shift it toward grimy mud and warm earth tones by putting more sienna in it. And um, I've found that really that's all I need as a basic set of colors. I do like Payne's gray. It's a nice cool gray. It's fairly transparent. It's not real powerful. It doesn't carry very far. So Payne's gray I will generally use instead of black. I really don't find any purpose for black on my models. Black is a, is a largely unnatural color in terms of weathering. Um, you might find black and, you know, in a, in a coal mine or something, but generally black is not a, a, a good color in my toolkit for weathering. I'll occasionally bring in other colors. I might bring some in for, for this model. I'll bring in some white to add some opaqueness to these colors and to lighten them up for doing some panel lines on the underside. I think I'm going to try it and we'll see. I'm also using a, a jar of uh, odorless mineral spirits that I've had for years now. Um, regular mineral spirits, when you, we're using them as Mr. Paint, it's an acrylic lacquer. That means that the, it's a lacquer paint, the pigment is acrylic, um, but it's lacquer based. You can't reconstitute it from, uh, from its base with mineral spirits, only with lacquer solvents. So it's safe to work over with mineral spirits. and so. That's why I'm not going to seal it. I want it to be nice and semi-gloss so that I don't get any spread. Later, once we flat coat it, I will use the flat coat and the staining, spreading nature of that to show some uh, other techniques as well. So I'm going to just mix some paint on my little palette here and keep dabbing uh, uh, some uh, mineral spirits in it. And I'll show you how I do some panel on it. Now I want you to see how intense some of this color is. This uh, ultramarine blue is very vibrant, very blue. This uh, burnt sienna, as you know, is a reddish, orangey, very warm color. You combine the two and you get a very dark, very, uh, very nice earthy gray. And you can shift it more toward neutral with the more blue that you put in there. And so you get a very dark, and very earthy tone so you can see there I don't know if my, my my lighting and camera are not perfect but as I drag my brush across the white you can see in there that's a nice warm gray now compare that to Payne's gray over here Payne's gray you can see is a nice cool almost a dark dark blue this is a cool gray compared to that this is useful too when you combine it with burnt sienna. You can get some nice colors here that are about the same. So Payne's gray can give you a little more uh, dull, a little more earthy color when mixed with the burnt sienna. And not quite as powerful as uh, this over here. Now what I'll do is I'll actually dilute it right here to something about something about that. And I'll put that on the model and see how it performs. Alright you can see where we stand here. We've done some uh, some oil wash here. We've dirtied up some areas where you might expect crew to step. We're going to do a little bit more there. All right, so I've got some feedback on my uh, on my model. Uh, That's something you should always do is get feedback and critique, good criticism. And just as I, I thought, uh, fresh eyes the next day told me that 
There's probably a little too much uniformity going on with the graininess of my salt weathering. And so I'm going to use oil paints to uh, uh, kind of fade some of the paint and break up some of that uniformity. And uh, so what I've done, I've take, taken some white and I've taken some Payne's Gray with a little bit of raw umber. I believe that's raw umber, it's not burnt umber. But Payne's Gray, like I said when we were preparing our oil washes, the remnants of which you can still see here, Payne's Gray is not a real powerful black or gray, and it's very blue. And if you notice, the, the RLM gray on here is kind of a, it leans toward purple. And so I take some of this blue and mix it in, into some white paint, and take some of this very warm reddish umber color and put a dab of it in here. I get a nice neutral gray that shifts a little toward the violet or the purple side because blue and red make purple. So it's and with a pretty tight brush, I'm going to put some little spots in a semi-random area or semi-random pattern. And I'm going to see what it looks like once once these spots are in here. I'm going to go back in and take me a soft brush here. And very lightly just kind of blend that in so you see what it does it lightens everything up a bit and as I feather it out into the finish there I still have gray but I'm lightening up the surface there and fading it a little bit and I can drag some of it on my dry brush here I can drag some of it to other areas of my finish. And so what you get is some actual impression of actual fading there. And so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go over the gray areas here with this kind of bright white, especially these upper areas that would be exposed to the sun. And I think that's a pretty convincing effect. I'm real pleased with that actually. I used some ultramarine blue, some burnt sienna, and a little bit of yellow. And um, I drug in some of this Payne's Gray as well to get me something that wasn't a, a real intense green, but had some of that definite bluish cool green going on. And then I would just dab them into areas and with an, another a broad dry brush, gently work them around. And what I've done is I've taken away some of the graininess that was up in here, especially along the top, and some of the graininess along these wing panels. And um, I think it gives a real nice effect. All right, well, my top side has dried a bit, and it's enough that I can flip it over. Now I'm going to bring in some white because I'm working on a lighter surface and I want my uh, panel lines not to be so glaring and dark. So just a little bit of white. We're gonna see what we get here with more of a, a gray color for our panel line wash on the undersurface. I'm just coming here and begin to do what we did on the other side. Just dot these into the panel lines and that gray will help to highlight the panel lines that are passing through the black, although there's not many of them, you, you do want those to be highlighted. I've got too much thinner on my brush. So you just sop that up. Sans arrêt, épuisé. Around the landing gear, the wheels are going to open, they're going to be right about here. So I've put some staining where you might get some dirt kicked up. Mud, dirt, grime. Just a little bit, not too much, just, you know, we're not making this a tank. And of course it would be on the flaps as well. Uh, quite a bit on the flaps actually. I've seen aircraft with quite dirty flaps because they get a lot of air, air, air flow. They're in the airflow and they're right there closer to the wheels. Also back here on the horizontal stabilizers about in line with the wing and the tips, you know, a little bit of dirt. Uh, I've dirtied up this area on a tail dragger. You get, uh, this is close to the ground, put some dirt there. You got to think about this, and I mean, that might not be super prototypical. I don't know, but uh, it just seems to me that if you're going to have dirt on an aircraft, that's where it's going to be. The oil cooler, I presume, leaks oil, so I've done a little bit of oil streaking here, so that when I put the oil cooler on there, there's uh, there's some outflow there. 
Also up here, I assume that the oil in the engine occasionally leaks out, uh, as most engines do. And I've done some streaking there as well. And I haven't dirtied this up super uh, filthy because um, this, while this is a well-used aircraft, pictures show that it's not you know just covered in grunge completely and dripping in oil. So a little bit of oil staining there. So I'm going to let this dry and I'm going to flat coat the whole thing and uh, we'll see if we're done yet. All right, so I've got my all my coats that I'm gonna do down and I'm gonna get a larger cup here on the old airbrush so I can put my final my final dull coat on. Now I use this uh, basic testers dull coat. It is, uh, if I can reach it back in here. It is still, in my opinion, the best lacquer there is. Basic testers dull coat. Now this is an old bottle, it's kind of yellow but uh, thinned with lacquer thinner this stuff is wonderful marvelous stuff when you mask with bare metal foil the hardest part is to lift up a corner and i use an exacto blade and lift up a corner and then i just take my tweezers and i begin to work that corner up and the the beauty of a flat coat on top of your model is that it gives strength to the mask itself and you can just peel that mask up little by little but uh, if you do have residue from bare metal foil that is not a problem uh, there's a product called heptane and you can buy it commercially as as bestine uh, bestine is a rubber cement thinner uh, it's for uh, various other industrial uses but this stuff uh, will take all your stickers off your CD cases if you still buy CDs. Um, it's good to have around. But it will take that, uh, that bare metal foil residue right off your canopy with a Q-tip. All right, well, I finished this thing. Here we go. This is the D520. All done. I will uh, put some pictures there and give you a little quick walk around of um, this aircraft. <laughs> Um, I'm pretty pleased with it. I, I'm, I'll show you some things right off the bat. Notice along these back windows here, you got that bright line. I don't know how to get rid of that bright line when kit manufacturers give you glass that goes flush right up to where the, the glass ends. Ideally, you would want to extend that glass beyond this white line into the plastic here. That way you could mask it and paint over, you know, you could fill the seam. But then when you put your mask down, you don't have this white edge of the glass showing. That's always detracting from these kind of kits like this or P40 that has those teardrop uh, over the shoulder windows. So there we go. I'll show you some better pictures and uh, let you uh, decide whether or not this is a, a successful paint job. Alright, well, one thing that I've, I wanted to talk to you about is getting feedback because if I just say, hey man, I did a great job on my model and, and I don't care to get people's opinions, then um, 
well, I'm not really going to grow anything. I'm going to stagnate. I'm not going to get any better. I'm not going to learn new techniques. I'm not. Gonna, I need constructive criticism. So I've already posted my pictures on the Skill Modders Critique Group on Facebook, and um, I've already got some good critiques. One of the very first ones, John Griesbacher, uh, asked me if the invasion stripe should have more dust on the lower wings. Well, maybe so. They're pretty clean. While well, right next to it, the wheels have kicked up a bunch of dirt. So that's uh, that's something I may have overlooked and good uh, good criticism. Uh, I had asked about photographing models, so I got some good ideas and reminders of where to find information on how to photograph. Uh, Will asked me about uh, my uh, chips and spacing, and someone else asked me about this too, on the propeller. And people are saying, well, it kind of looks like you used liquid mask on there to chip it, which uh, indicates we probably weren't random enough and didn't pay quite close enough attention to the story we're trying to tell with that propeller, and I agree. Um, so yeah, you got to be willing to get feedback and put your stuff out there for um, for critique. There are some other areas on this model that are critique worthy. The roundels, uh, the decals are not very well settled into the into the um, panel lines. Like I said, when we were putting them down, there's some transparency going on. The wheels are wonky. Um, I busted off a. a I busted off part of the oleo and had to glue that on and it's kind of wonky. Um, so there's a, there's some problems here and there, but overall I'm pleased with the paint job, I'm pleased with the model, and um, I hope that you uh, maybe uh, learn some techniques that you haven't tried or were inspired to do some techniques that you've tried in the past, And because I certainly was. I was inspired to try some techniques that uh, generally I don't employ, but uh, probably will from here on out. Well, there's my D520. Thanks for spending all this time, and I'm very grateful that you've joined me on the workshop recorder. Until we have another project going on together, happy modeling, and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.